The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. There is no resurrection. Came to Jesus and put this question to him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, If someone's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman and died, leaving no descendants. So the second brother married her and died, leaving no descendants. And the third likewise. And the seven left no descendants. Last of all, the woman also died. At the resurrection, when they arise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had been married to her. Jesus said to them, You are not misled because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. When they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like the angels in heaven. As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God told him, I am the God of Abraham? the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly misled. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us begin with our novena prayer. O great Saint Peregrine, you have been called the Wonder Worker because of the numerous miracles which you have obtained from God for those who have had recourse to you. For so many years you bore in your own flesh the debilitating disease of cancer. I seek God's healing. Help me to imitate your enduring faith in the face of my great challenge, that I may trust the Lord as you did in your time of affliction. Help me to find the strength to proclaim God's presence in my life, despite the anguish and fear this disease causes in me and my loved ones. O glorious Saint Peregrine, aided in this way by your powerful intercession, I will sing to God now and for all eternity a song of gratitude for his great goodness and mercy. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth, O Lord, thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who sent the Holy Spirit to enlighten the hearts of the faithful, grant that we, by the sending of the same Holy Spirit, may be ever truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. This we ask through Christ our Lord. St. Norbert, St. Peregrine, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. So, From the beginning till now, on our journey, we started by getting the road map. And then we packed our bags with the things that we would need to walk this journey. And now we're walking. And one of the things about any sort of pilgrimage, and indeed our life is a pilgrimage, John Paul II of blessed memory, would often call us that, the Pilgrim Church. We are in pilgrimage, in transition in this life, heading toward our heavenly homeland. And God wants us to get there. This was the centerpiece of yesterday's message. God is doing everything that he can to get us there. But one of the things that's necessary to get there, one of the things that we must endure, is hardship on the road. All journeys, all journeys have hardship. And so in order to endure the hardship, there are two things that we receive. One is the consolations, in this case, as we spoke about earlier, the sacraments. But there's another one, and it's the more difficult one. But it's the one thing that all of the spiritual masters, every single one of them, and our brother, the great theologian, Gary Goulagrange, speaks about, and that is 
the question of consolations, or rather, the necessity of purgation. The necessity of purgation in our life. And what does this mean, this purgation? There are two types of purgation, but today I'll speak about the first one. And that is the purgation of the senses. The purgation of the senses is specifically the afflictions that we experience. It's sort of like spiritual training. You know, if you go to the gym, you have to work hard to get muscles. If you go to the gym and then go into the sauna, sit in the sauna for a little while, and then go out and get a smoothie, you don't really develop those muscles, right? You just kind of sit in the sauna and have a smoothie. But if you go to the gym and you start working on the machines and working hard, you know, covered in sweat and a little bit of exhaustion, then you start to grow in health, right, physical health. Well, likewise, emotional health in the spiritual life is very important. And this happens, as St. John of the Cross tells us, by Rejecting consolations. And this is what the purgation is, and where it begins, by the rejection of consolations. What does this gain us? What does this gain us? It makes our faith grounded upon solid rock rather than shifting sand. When I did youth ministry, which I did for about a decade, one of the things that I noticed about the young, and not just the young, but principally the young, is that their dedication to the faith often followed their emotional states. When they were down, they felt God was far away from them. And when they were happy, God was really close to them. And their faith life would vacillate between the two, depending on where their emotional states were. But the discipline of eschewing consolations, those effective emotional consolations of the faith, what this does is allows us to focus on God alone, focus on the sacraments alone, and not how we feel about them at any given moment or how we just feel at any given moment. Down the hallway here is that wonderful picture of Mother Teresa. And whenever I look at that picture of Mother Teresa, I always remember the fact that for the 40 years that we knew her in public life, she received no consolations of the faith. It brought her no joy. Not a single drop. She recounts this in her diary. But she persevered in what was right and what was good and what was true. Because she knew that it was right, good, and true. And that was enough for her. That was enough. I so happened to have a friend... uh, couple friends, one who died very recently of cancer, uh, who got to spend time with her the day before she died. And they said that she was a different person. They knew her quite well. They said that she was a different person that last day. She was like she was 14, giddy, running around like a, like a schoolgirl. Now, this was not the Mother Teresa that they knew. If you ever met Mother Teresa, she was very grave, very serious, very, very hard in many ways. And that last day, they described it as if all 40 years of consolations that God had deprived her of were poured out upon her that single day as a gift for fidelity. Miss or not? Is seeking after God for his sake and purifying our own motives 
so they're not so we're not seeking God for our sake. Because love is not about me. Love is about the other person. Love is always a gift of myself to another. And that's the relationship that we must foster with God. A true relationship of love. Where I'm giving all of myself, asking nothing in return. And if I get something in return, then I bless it with my gratitude. But the ground of my faith must be gift. It must always be gift. And sometimes it's difficult to give that gift because there's so little of me left. And yet, just like the widow's might, whatever is left in my soul must be dedicated to God. Let us pray our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was most despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need, that I may...